Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, which was on Hebrews 10, 8 through 10. So we are going to finish out chapter 10 this week and may get in a little bit to chapter 11, but I don't know if we'll uh, have time for that. We, we ended pretty early last week, um, so we will see where that takes us. And we'll just go ahead and jump right into the verse here, uh, Hebrews 10, 8 through 10. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. So you'll see there in verse 8, this is really an argument that Jesus was the plan all along. Now, one of the advantages of being a grad student studying theology and looking into church history and New Testament theology this past semester, one of the more interesting things that I got to do is to look through church history and see where some of the heresies and some of the false teachings started to crop up. It's interesting that this is actually one of the very first heresies. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the earliest. You, you have heresies that come before this one, specifically those that were trying to Judaize and, and sort of incorporate the Old Testament into the New. That's actually part of what Hebrews is answering. Uh, and then there was also uh, several other heresies that precede this. But one of the earliest heresies is that essentially Jesus wasn't really God's original intention that he was just kind of a stopgap, that God had always intended for salvation to come through Israel. That his plan from the very beginning was, uh, and, and this is, they go back to the prophecies of the Old Testament and essentially say, well, what God really wanted to do, his real intention was that salvation was going to come through Abraham, that all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed through him. And so because of that, Jesus was supposed to come to earth and rule as the king of Israel there. But if you look at this verse, it makes a fairly compelling case that even if you look back through to the Old Testament, that God had always intended for Jesus to be sacrificed. Now, the ones that subscribe to this theory would say that, well, if, if Jerusalem had just accepted Jesus as their king and made him their actual earthly king, then he wouldn't have had to be sacrificed for the sins of the world and mankind could have obtained salvation without that. But if you read Hebrews, that's not what it says. If you understand, and this is a, a quote that we've actually already seen in Hebrews before, um, if you understand this quotation and you look and, and see back, I believe this one's from Malachi, um, you can look back at this and see that God had never intended for the sacrifices and offerings to be the answer to sin. In fact, you will see several times in the Old Testament, specifically in the major and minor prophets, where Israel was actually engaging in sacrifices correctly. Because you'll see that this part in, in uh, parentheses here in the latter part of verse 8, which the Hebrew author adds, uh, almost as an afterthought, he's saying all of these things were according to the law. And if you look at the original text, that's exactly what he's saying. The laws were being followed. The Sabbaths were being adhered to. And God's answer to that was, stop doing the sacrifices, stop observing the Sabbaths. They are doing you no good. God preferred them to stop engaging in the rituals and pretending like they were obeying his will while they were simultaneously ignoring his other commandments, like taking care of the poor, looking after those that were less fortunate, like widows and orphans, uh, obeying the laws to obey your parents, keeping the other commandments. And this is the same thing that we see in sort of a different form when Jesus arrives on the scene and tells the Pharisees that they are ignoring the weightier measures of the law. They're willing to go around the world to make sure they're contributing exactly the right amount of tithe and mint and cumin, but they're completely ignoring things like honoring their father and mother. And so this is the same kind of thing that is being introduced to the Hebrew audience 
going back to part of Israel's history where Israel was engaging in the sacrifices. They were doing everything the law of Moses said in terms of the rituals that they were going through. Well, if the sacrifice is all that's needed to get rid of sin, then why didn't it work then? If all you needed was the blood of a bull or a goat to be spilled, then why did that not get rid of sin then? Because they were doing that ritual. The point is that a spiritual sacrifice, a spiritual obedience to God in a right spirit has always been what God desired. You can go back to, for example, Psalms 51, where Jesus, or where, where Jesus' uh, great-great-great-great-grandfather David observes this long before Jesus comes on the scene, where he says, it is not sacrifices that you desire, but a contrite heart and a broken spirit. And so we understand that this concept, if you look back to the Old Testament, there is plenty of evidence that suggests that something other than just the blood of bulls and goats was always going to be needed to forgive sin. And that's exactly what the Hebrew author is appealing to here. He's saying that if the ritual was all you needed, then why is it at times in Israel's history where they were actually doing the ritual that it didn't get rid of their sin? And so he's saying that 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 argument does not make sense. There was always an intention by God to make Jesus the one-time sacrifice for all time. And you can see prophecies of that over and over. We could literally do just an entire class, an entire semester, just on that one principle. But the Hebrew author is bringing it to their attention that that was something that was true even in the Old Testament. And then in verse 10 where he talks about this idea of sanctifying yourself. Uh, and that's something that, if you'll look back through Leviticus 11.44, Leviticus 27, and Numbers 11.18, those were all commands that were happening in the Old Testament. This was something that he's hearkening back to. There was a command for the priest to sanctify themselves. Well, that's in contrast to what is being offered in verse 10, where he's saying that Jesus Christ is the one that sanctifies us. And so in the same theme that we've been going through this entire time period that we've been looking at the book of Hebrews, he's drawing yet another contrast between the new law and the old law, where in the old law, the priest, which you'll remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at the passage where it talks about all, uh, it talks about Jesus being the high priest and we being the, the priests that serve under him. Here we have a verse that talks about sanctifying yourself, which was the command under the old law. Now he's saying that we are sanctified by Jesus. And so even the sanctification of the priests that serve under the new covenant is superior because it is God do, the one, that is the one doing the sanctifying, not mankind sanctifying himself. So let's go ahead and read verses 11 through 14. Every priest stands daily ministering, and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. From a strictly rhetorical perspective, this is a fascinating couple of verses because what the author does here, here is, he, is he sets up a direct contrast. So every single portion of these two sentences, verses 11 and verse 12, they are meant to contradict one another and show the superiority of the new covenant. For example, you have every priest in verse 11 versus he, so singular, one, when it comes to Jesus. Then you have, he stands daily ministering versus Jesus Christ who is seated at God's right hand. Then you have daily ministering, so offering the sacrifices on a daily basis versus Jesus who offered one sacrifice. And then you have this idea of the priest offering the same sacrifices versus Jesus who only had to offer one sacrifice for sin for all time. And then you also have at the end, and this is sort of the, the crux on which this entire argument rests, he says that that sacrifice, because of all those things, never takes away all sin versus the sacrifice of Jesus, which has taken away sin for all time. That's the point that he has been building to this entire time. And so 
the interesting thing about this is it, it sets both of these ideas in juxtaposition and does so in a very effective way. First of all, the every is emphasizing that many, many priests were needed under the old law versus he, talking about Jesus, being the only priest that was necessary for the ultimate sacrifice. And then stands versus seated. This may not necessarily be something that translates well to a 21st century idea. However, this is something that a person living in this time would have understood very well. Uh, for example, whenever you would have teachers come in, famous teachers from around the, uh, the, the Middle East of, of Jewish law, you would have them come in and, and the Jewish teacher who was the guest of honor would sit and that's how he would teach. And all the students stood. Very different than the way we're doing now. I'm standing, you guys are all sitting. So it was kind of the opposite then that the person that was the uh, center of attention and the person that was the person to be honored was the person that was seated versus standing. So when you look at this idea of Jesus being seated at God's right hand versus the priests who are standing, the reason that they're standing is because they're continuing to serve. That's what the law of Moses prescribes for them. They serve and then they are done serving and then they have to serve again because their sacrifices are repetitive. That's very different than Jesus' sacrifice to where he offered himself once for all time, now his work is done. He has done the great sacrifice and now he is seated in the place of honor because his one sacrifice took place over all of time. Uh, the daily versus eternal, that's just sort of an extension of this idea of his sacrifices being one time and eternal. And then the never versus all time when it talks about taking away from sin. This is actually a really interesting point because it's a little bit different, a little more nuanced than the previous ones because he's talking about this idea of never taking away sin. It's true that under the old law, the law of Moses, these sins were something that had to be done over and over and over and over again. But he's saying no amount of repetition, no amount of blood, no amount of animal sacrifices would have ever taken away sin were it not for Jesus. So even if they did everything right under the old law, even if they could keep the old law perfectly, there would actually still be no way to forgive sin. Now, if you were to keep the law perfectly as Jesus did, you would have no need for that sacrifice because you would be sinless and therefore be vindicated. But as we know from Romans 5, no one ever actually accomplished that. So if you want to forgive sin, the blood of bulls and goats just ain't going to cut it. And that's what he's saying here is that no matter how often these sacrifices were repeated, there was never a chance that they were ever going to remove even one sin. Jesus' sacrifice, on the other hand, came and it eliminated all sin for all time. And then verse 14 here is kind of his thesis. It's been what all of this has been building up to, the main point of his entire uh, speech up until this point. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So unlike the priest who had to sanctify something and then things would happen, you know, somebody touches a dead body, somebody accidentally comes in contact with an unclean animal, something like that has to be sanctified again. And then life would happen, and then they would be no longer sanctified, and then they had to be sanctified again, and then had to be sanctified again. That's not the way that it works under Jesus Christ. He made a sacrifice at one time, our sins are forgiven one time, and then we are sanctified from then on. That sanctification process never fades away under Jesus. It is permanent. And actually, this brought me to an interesting discussion that I had last week after our lesson where we were talking about this theme uh, with Doug, where he kind of prompted me to explain it in a, I think, a better way. The difference in the sacrifice that is being talked about under the old law and being talked about with Jesus is with the old law, the sacrifice is repetitive. The sacrifice of Jesus is continuous, but not repetitive. Instead of happening over and over again, it happened once, and that one occasion overlaps all of time. And so it's a continual cleansing, a continual sanctification, not one that has to be done over and over again. And that's really what the Hebrew author is driving at here. So let's go ahead and look at Hebrews 10, 15 through 18. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying... This is the covenant in which I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws upon their hearts and I will write them on their mind. He then said, 
and their sins and their lawless deeds I will no longer remember. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, an offering for sin is no longer required. So this quotation, which we've already seen once in Hebrews 8, comes from Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34. However, in Hebrews 8, this verse really showed that the old covenant was displaced by the new. You remember that was sort of the crux of his argument. He was saying that since Jeremiah foretold this, then what that was supposed to do, what that was intended to do, is give us a hint that the old law was going to go away at one point and was going to be replaced by the new. That's not the main point of why he brings this up again, and that's why he repeats himself, because he's using the same passage to make a different point. Now he is quoting it to say that there is a new offer of forgiveness. And we'll see that in the, if you look at verse 18, that's exactly what he's talking about, is now he's shifting the focus, and that's why he doesn't quote the entire passage, he just quotes this part, and then the part about not remembering their sin and lawless deeds. And so, while earlier he was trying to emphasize a different point of the Scripture, here he's trying to bring to their attention the idea of forgiveness. And so, this is kind of the conclusion to his doctrinal points, and we'll get to what I call his... his uh, his conclusion and sort of his summary in just a second when we look at verse 19. But in this particular passage, this is kind of his wrap-up of everything that he's done so far. And so he says, basically what all of this has been building up to is that the reason that the new law is superior to the old is because you have a chance of forgiveness under the new law. There was no chance of forgiveness ever under the old law. There is a forgiveness for that sin. And that's why he brings up this passage in Jeremiah is because he's trying to bring that to their attention as well. But this is something that was always planned. It was always part of God's divine plan to save mankind. So let's go ahead and read Hebrews 19. And like I said, this is sort of the start of the Hebrew author's conclusion here. He's going to give a summary for the remainder of Hebrews 10 of the things that have been discussed so far. So let's go ahead and read that in verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let's approach God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water." So in this conclusion, the reason that I say that there's a shift here and he's kind of already made all of his doctrinal points, you'll notice that at the beginning of that verse, he's saying, therefore. And so that is a denotation of a transition. He's saying, I've presented you with the evidence. I've given you all of the Old Testament verses that point to exactly what I'm saying. Now here's the practical application. Now this is what this means for you, what you should be doing. And he starts that really in verse 19, not only with a conclusion, but also to, with an appeal to his readers. So, if the veil was his flesh, which verse 20 talks about, what was the only way to get through that veil into God's presence? Well, in the doctrinal sense, yes, that's absolutely true, because you have to pass through the blood. But right now we're talking about the flesh of, of Christ. If, if the flesh is the veil and that's symbolic of the separation between the holy place and the holy of holies, then what is the way to get into that presence? Uh, well, the Lord's Supper certainly has that symbolism. You're on the right track. Destroying the flesh, exactly. That's kind of what I was fishing for. Thank you for that. Um, oh, it, the destruction of the flesh. And that's why I said you were on the right track when you said it was the Lord's Supper. Well, what's the first thing you do with the Lord's Supper? You break the bread. And that is a symbolism, as Jesus tells us, of a breaking of his body. And so this is central to the New Testament documentation. This is central to the theology of the entire New Testament, is this idea that if you have to get to God's presence through Christ, then his blood has to be shed, which means the body has to be broken. And so... This symbolism that he brings up here is making a powerful point that to get to God's presence, Jesus' death was an inevitability. There was no way for us to enter that presence until 
the body of Christ was broken and pierced so that we could enter into that veil. Um, and that is, of course, why you have to pass through the blood, because what happens after you break through the flesh, you have to go through the blood. And that's how we enter into God's presence. And so you were all on the right track. You were kind of around there, but uh, the idea of breaking the flesh is uh, what this is, is really emphasizing here. So along those lines, and it, it talking about us actually entering into God's presence, which of course is, is important, the reaction to that, what does it truly mean to have confidence when approaching God's presence? Because that's what we're commanded to do here. So what does that look like? Right, so that's something that is, is very Old Testament-like. Uh, so that's a good point. For those of you who may not have been able to hear, um, he was saying that there is a level of preparation that takes place with that. And so um, if you're going to enter God's presence, one of the ways that you would have confidence is to be prepared for that. And the sanctification process that is being discussed here would be a part of that. That's what sanctification is. It is preparing you for service with God. Any other thoughts on that? Confidence that God will hear us because we're in Christ. I appreciate the, the take on that, especially because it emphasizes the fact that our confidence doesn't come from our own self, it comes from Christ. And, and really, sanctification is the same thing, isn't it? You have confidence in yourself, not because, like the verse we were just looking at, not because we sanctified ourselves like the priests of old did, but because God has sanctified us, that we have been sanctified through Christ. Right, because confidence that God will hear us because... In that, we're not only confident in the sense that we're able to enter God's presence safely, but also the fact that we are confident that once we're there, we're not just wasting our time, that, that God is actually going to hear our request and take note of them. Any other thoughts? The confidence that you're talking about there comes from what we would call assurance, right? This idea that you're assured of what you know, you're confident in what you know, and that it is actually indeed correct. Therefore, you can enter with confidence because you you have a certain level of trust in the knowledge that you have. And so this isn't sort of a, a wavering back and forth. I don't know, maybe I'm doing the right thing, maybe I'm not. Because you have that, that understanding of who Jesus is, you have that confidence that uh, what you are doing is, is right and that God's going to hear you because you have confidence that he's real and that he's listening and that you have that right relationship with him through Jesus. So, right. And, and you know actually what that reminds me of, and I'm just kind of spitballing here, um, but that actually makes me think of the marriage covenant, which is often regarded as our relationship between Jesus and the church. It's kind of the same thing, right? Like if you're just dating somebody and you have a fight, you're like, okay, is this going to be the fight that breaks us up or not? Once you're married, that question goes away. And so it's just a question of what do we, where do we go from here? Like it's, it's not a question of, or at least it shouldn't be, um, are we going to wind up breaking up after this? And so it's that same kind of thing, that assurance that once you have that relationship with Christ, that your relationship with God has been solidified. And so uh, when you come before him with certain things, it's, it's never a question of, um, you know, is, the, is God really there? That kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I kind of see what you're saying there. Um, so getting a little bit more specific, but thinking along the same kind of lines. Why might the people that the Hebrew author is writing to right now, why, why might they need that kind of confidence that we're talking about? What specific need do they have that might necessitate them having this kind of confidence? Okay, so persecution, we know for a fact that that's happening because of things we've seen elsewhere in the, uh, in the book of Hebrews. So that's definitely a concern, especially, I mean, really with any Christian group in the first century, that's a concern. But yeah, uh, definitely a good one to point out. What else? Uh, the confidence that you have, you have in the real God because you're, you're not worried about all these different paganistic God, this sort of pluralistic culture that a lot of them were living in. Um, that was probably a little less true for the people in Hebrews because if our theory is correct, that, it was, that this was addressed largely to a Hebrew audience probably living in Judea. They may not have had to deal with it as much, but it's still something they had to deal with. I mean, there's still Hellenists all over the place. So, yeah, definitely a concern that confidence would have helped with. Um, one other thing that I kind of think about as well, um, because I think that those are all legitimate concerns, and I had down persecution and, and dealing with false teachers and that kind of thing as well. Uh, but another thing that I think may be a, a great concern to them 
uh, considering what they're dealing with now is this idea of this specific audience, you remember, is having to deal with people that they're very close to, people that they love, telling them that they're wrong and that they should come back to the real God, which is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, worship Moses, or sorry, worship God the way that Moses prescribed, that kind of thing. And so there may have been some of the Christians that are dealing with this that are thinking in the back of their head, is this Jesus guy really, really who we've said he is? And that's why, that, that's a big part of the reason that the book of Hebrews exists is because he's writing to those people that are wondering, should I just fall back into Judaism? Did maybe I, I read some of the signs wrong? And so he's, he's saying this to sort of build up their confidence in their knowledge that Christ is the Messiah and he is the one whom God sent. And so that's part of the reason that they might need the same level of confidence is that they can come before the throne knowing that when they come to God in Jesus' name, that that is something that God approves of. And really, it's the people that don't do that that are no longer approved in God's sight. Uh, so verse 22, I, I love the way that it describes this, where it talks about having our hearts sprinkled clean with a clear conscience. If you have been a Christian for a significant amount of time, and if you have ever gone through a period of time where you were struggling with a specific sin, maybe there was some sin that you were dealing with that you had struggled for weeks, maybe months, or even years on end, once you start breaking that cycle, I don't know about you, but there's almost nothing as rewarding as going to bed with a clean conscience. Uh, it, it changes your whole life. And it, it kind of reminds me, and I know that this is a silly example, but I have to use things from my life to kind of relate to this. Uh, for those of you who may not know, I help run one of the dorms at Faulkner. I have to do room inspections periodically when we're suspect that they have things that they shouldn't in their room. And I wouldn't say always, but there's a pretty good percentage of time where you can walk in and you don't even have to look around. You can tell which ones have something in their room they shouldn't have because you can see they do not have a clear conscience. You can see the expression on their face when you walk in and you're like, something's wrong here. Now, the ones that you walk in and they do have a clear conscience because there's nothing in there you're going to find that's against the rules, you can tell a difference because you know that they have a clear conscience because they know you're not going to find anything. And so it's the same kind of idea here, this idea that because your spirit has been sprinkled clean with the blood of Christ, you don't have to worry about when I'm coming before God, okay, is God going to hear me? Am I in a right relationship with Him? Have I been good enough today for God to hear me and actually take my request seriously? That's not a thought that should ever enter a Christian's head. Because we have been sprinkled clean by Christ's blood, and that is what sanctifies us, and that is what, may, what allows us to enter God's presence. It's because of His merit and His goodness, not because of ours. And that's exactly what the Hebrew author is addressing here. So let's go ahead and move on to verses 23 through 25. Let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds, not abandoning our own meeting together, as the habit of some people, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So verse 23, one of the things I think is it's kind of addressing here where it talks about holding firmly to this confession without wavering. The truth is there's no such thing as a fire insurance Christian. And those are the Christians that are kind of culturally Christian and they were sort of born into it and they kind of claim Christianity just in case there's a God out there. They're not real sure about it, but we're going to go ahead and claim this kind of Christianity and kind of go through some of the motions just in case God happens to turn out that he's real. That's not a Christian. And that's what this verse addresses right here. The, the people that are actually the people of God, the ones that are actually following him are the ones that are confident in him and that hold firmly to that confession of hope. Uh, hope is anticipation combined with expectation. And so if you don't have that expectation, if you're just kind of hedging your bets and trying to make sure that you haven't ticked God off too much just in case you have to face him one day, that's not the way Christianity works. And that's one thing that he is kind of alluding to. We'll see a similar sentiment in Acts 17 when, when Paul is preaching at the Areopagus on Mars Hill. 
where he's talking about to the unknown God, that's what the pagans were doing. They were just saying, here's all the idols and the different uh, offerings we're going to give to all these different gods. And just in case there happens to be a God out there somewhere that we've missed, we don't want to you know, make him mad. So we're just going to have this extra temple over here to the unknown God so that we can offer to him just so we haven't left anybody out. And I find this hysterical because this is something that we're actually going through now. If you look at the way that our pluralistic society really emphasizes being all-inclusive and making sure nobody feels excluded and that your beliefs are just as good as everybody else's beliefs. I mean, they may be different than mine and they may even directly contradict mine, but that's okay. Whatever works for you. There's nothing in the New Testament that suggests that is anywhere in the realm of possibility. There is one God, there is the exclusive God, and that's it. And so this idea of holding firm to that confession without wavering That's what it's talking about right there. You're not hedging your bets. You're not just hoping that you're approved of this God, but you don't want to offend any other gods just in case they happen to be real too. You've made your choice. Pick one. And that's exactly what is being talked about here. That kind of confidence that we were talking about just a second ago comes from that attitude. Um, And really, verse 24 kind of continues on that idea where it talks about encouraging one another to love and good deeds. Confidence and courage are contagious. When people see other Christians, other people of faith, leading the charge and living a life that reflects this kind of confidence, other people know it and other people wind up reflecting that as well. We're about to look to, here in in just a little bit, whether it'll be tonight or or probably more likely sometime next week, uh, Hebrews 11. That's all Hebrews 11 is. It's just a long series of stories and reminders from the Old Testament of heroes of the faith to encourage people to follow in their footsteps of faithfulness. Because the Hebrew author understands this idea of having confidence and having that kind of courage that God demands from us. A great way to establish that and to practice that is to look at other people that have that and emulate them. And then in verse 25, I have to say, and I... I'm going to tread lightly here because I know there's going to be some people that that might be a little upset at me with phrasing it this way, but I'm, I'm just saying what I think. That verse does not say be at church every time the doors are open. I'm not saying that that's not a lesson that we can draw from that, but frankly, I get a little tired of every single time this verse is invoked. That's the only message that we tend to draw out of it. And again, I'm, I'm not saying that you can't look at it and see that from there. But frankly, I think the true meaning of this verse is so much deeper. And part of that comes from the idea of, first of all, the context. Because what is being discussed here? What he is talking about is addressing a group of Hebrews that are thinking about abandoning the church and retreating back into Judaism. This is not people that just want to come to church one or two times a month. I mean, don't get me wrong, that's a serious problem too. But what is being addressed here is much more serious. In fact, if you look into the Greek, the word that is used here, neglect, uh, the Greek word is uh, enkata alipontes, I believe. I'm sure I messed that up. But very long Greek word. But the, the Greek word actually means abandon or to leave behind. So these are not just people that had a hard time showing up on Sunday night. These are people that were thinking about completely abandoning the Christian faith. And so it's a much more serious thing. But the truth is, if you understand this verse in its context and understand what it's actually talking about, it actually goes much deeper. Because it's not just speaking to physically showing up and being present at a church building when worship is happening. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's, not, that's an incorrect application of the verse. I'm just saying there's more to it than that. And the true spirit behind it is, we're supposed to love and encourage one another. How can we do that if we don't meet together to worship? And so, you could draw the same lesson out of it, but we need to go deeper when we communicate that to people, because what it's actually saying is, not just, you need to be at church because you need to be at church. What it's saying is, you need to be around God's people because you cannot spiritually survive without it. There is a necessity there to surround yourself with godly people because we love each other, we encourage one another, and that kind of faith and courage that we have when approaching the throne of grace is contagious. 
And that's why we need one another and need to be present with one another. And that's why he specifically says that we're going to be encouraging one another, driving each other onto the day of judgment. So let's look at verse uh, 26 through 31. For if we go on sinning willfully, willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has ignored the law of Moses is put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe a punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Under the old law, God was harsher to Israel. That's something that's consistent. Does God punish other nations for their sin? Yes. And we know that from Romans 1, that's because even evident within God's creation, there were proofs that they should have known better. However, God was always harsher on Israel when they sinned. Why? Because they were supposed to know better. They had every advantage. They had the law of Moses. They had the judges. They had the kings. They had all of these things that were supposed to make them God's promised nation, his special possession, to show the rest of the world how to live, and then they failed in that responsibility. And what is being drawn upon in this verse in Hebrews is the church is new Israel, which has a lot more privileges and also comes with much harsher punishment if you abandon it. So he's spurring these people not to abandon their faith specifically for that, and he's drawing on very Old Testament ideas with that. It actually kind of reminds me of the parable of the servants and the son where he talks about this idea of trampling the son of God underfoot. Because you'll remember in the parable of the servants and the son, which comes from Matthew 21, 33 through 39, Jesus is talking about this man that is trying to get his house in order and, and he sends his servants to the vineyard over and over again and they keep killing his servants. And he says, well, now I'll send my son because surely they'll respect my son enough to actually listen to him. And then he sends his son and they kill his son and, and throw him in a ditch as well. And it Jesus' question afterward is, what do you think that he's going to do to those servants? And it's like, well, it's not going to be good. And that's exactly the same kind of sentiment that is being reflected here in Hebrews. He's saying, yes, and if this is the wrath of the God of the Old Testament that you guys are familiar with, what do you think his reaction is going to be when you reject his son after having learned the gospel? And so this is an encouragement to remain in the faith as well. Because as verse 30 points out, if the covenant is greater then the punishment is also greater for not keeping it. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm not trying to teach that there's going to be levels of hell or anything like that. I'm, I'm merely suggesting that what the passage is pointing out here is that God's anger is going to be fierce against those who reject his son. And, and this sort of, this same idea, which is the reason he quotes Deuteronomy 32 through uh, verse 35, it comes directly from that. So since we're out of time, real quickly, we'll just finish up the chapter here. Uh, verses 32 through 39. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through insults and distress, and partly by becoming companions with those that were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have yourselves a better and lasting possession. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For, in, uh, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my, righteousness, my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not among those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith for the safekeeping of the soul. So two things really quickly. First of all, this is a very Old Testament appeal. In the same way that the prophets would very often call back to the early days of Israel when God called Israel out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land, 
He's doing the same thing in these verses where he calls back to the early days of Christianity where their property was being seized, where they were being persecuted, and they welcomed people into it with open arms. And in the same way, he's appealing to that early stage of Christianity in the way that God appealed to the Israelites when he would want to call them back to repentance. The author is doing the same thing here, and he's using that and Habakkuk in order to do that, which is why he quotes it right there. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. We'll pick back up in in chapter 11 next week. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.